Welcome back, everyone. Uh, next up, we have Team Common Ground. Hi there. Uh, we're Team Common Ground, and uh, I'm joined on the stage by Susan Schwartzberg from the Exploratorium and Eric Prince from TLS. And we have a big multidisciplinary team. And no time to tell you about all of all the things that we've been doing or who we've been talking to. But um, I just want to take a moment to thank uh, Resilient by Design staff and everything that they've organized um, and, if you, and putting up with us. And if you can imagine getting in a car and driving cross country with your friends, and uh, now we're at the end, and now we're all the way to San Francisco and ready to get out of the car and uh, have a drink. <laughs> so pretty simply, you know, the Bay Area, as we all understand, is both affected seismically and in terms of uh, uh, sea level rise, in terms of how coastal resili resiliency has to be planned. So the Bay Area is really organized by the San Andreas Fault and the Hayward Fault. And the Bay falls in the soft zone in between those big ridges that they create. And not only the Bay, but all the soft lands that have washed down and, and created uh, alluvial uh, zones next to it, which are more prone to both coastal flooding and uh, seismic liquefaction. So we focused on San Pablo Bay. And uh, it has the same characteristics. There's a whole series of rocky prominences and ridges that plunge into the water. And in the fall, we were interested in developing a whole ferry network that would unite all these, these prominences into a future system for connecting uh, after big events. But the soft areas are, are key right now. The soft areas were where we ended up because this is key to adaptation right now. How are we going to deal with infrastructure that needs to perform in the next 10, 20 years? So we looked at uh, Highway 37, and we looked at the entire area north of it because they're inextricably linked, uh, the, the two of these things. And I'll show you how that is. Um, so our site, where are the baylands? What are the baylands? These are the zones between the open water and the uplands. And they are, we're looking out from Cougar Mountain into restored wetlands where the open water, Highway 37 already clogged, uh, soft land that is subject to, to tidal flow and watershed drainage. Um, this is Highway 37. It's already flooding. It's under capacity of two lanes. Uh, it's constricting both uh, traffic and it's constricting the flow of water uh, tidal exchange coming in and watershed drainage coming down. So it's performing two blockages at once. Um, this is the whole area we're talking about. We're talking about Highway 37 off to the left, uh, the whole baylands beyond, and then cities of American Canyon and Vallejo and, uh, and, the, and Mare Island. So first of all, uh, these cities depend on Highway 37 to get to work. And I can go into more about how that, how that happens. Um, they need something that will solve their transportation problem. This is key for them, key for them making a living. And then, and, and what do we say to them? And then there are people working in these baylands, restoring and taking over all, all the different entities that are doing fantastic work. Uh, they would like to remove this blockage. They'd like to get their work uh, more known and, and organized. What do we say to them if the highway goes there and how, how it works? And um, what do we say to the people in these cities, uh, these two cities that would like to get access to this area? It's, it's really hard right now, and they'd like to know more. So why, what is the deal with Highway 37? Um, the North Bay is going to experience the most uh, residential growth over the next 1,500 years. And you're seeing three red corridors. And these all, one is in Marin County with a, a more uh, affluent uh, profile. And then uh, to the right is uh, Solano County uh, and Napa County. And over there, we have the best, uh, most affordable housing in the entire uh, region. Um, and workforce housing will continue to develop there. So we, we can't afford to cut them off. There's no public transit here because there's you know, almost no density right now. Um, but uh, the key is that two-thirds of all these trips on Highway 37 are made by people that are earning at or below the median income. So there's an equity issue here uh, that affects politics uh, and not just highway tr uh, transportation and engineering. But at the same time, we have, uh, in between those, the, those quarters, we have ecological quarters. And, these, and it starts with the baylands we're already looking at. It's the largest patch in the entire bay. They'll be inundated by 2100. How do we deal with that? Uh, luckily, they have, they have space to migrate north. So there can be a big ecological corridor moving north for a, greater, uh, uh, for a more integrated uh, system that can persist over time. So, and one third of all the bay sediment comes from these two watersheds, Petaluma and, and Napa River. But we've got to find a way to negotiate how to move back and forth. And it's not going to work to just push it you know, one way or, or the other. We, I think we need to start engaging the problem now 
uh, how we can make, uh, uh, get these things, two things to work together, overlap. This is the entire biodiversity that you find within the baylands, moving from open water through marshes and meadows up to the uplands. And this is the group of people that are all working, trying to do something good. And uh, they're not always coordinated. They have all different ownerships, different jurisdictions. There's nothing that, that really coordinates them all together. So our question is, can we find a way to do that? Can we bring them together to a common plan, a common mission that will generate something larger? Now, there's nobody living here, um, but there's half a million people living in cities surrounding us. So this is, our, this is our region, this is our community, and these are the places that we went to go and talk with everybody to find out what are you looking for, do you need, and, and what are your stories, and, and how, do you, how do you relate to highways, how do you relate to nature? Uh, here's what they told us. They said there are four things that concern them. Um, number one, we don't even know what this is. We don't know what to call it. Uh, two, we're worry, worried it's going to flood. We're worried that we're going to lose uh, marshes. Uh, three, we're worried we can't get to work. And, we're, and we'd like to have more choices about how to get to work. We don't want to be stuck in our cars all the time. And fourth, we'd like to have access and we don't feel invited right now. So we've got to expand the constituency to people that don't currently have access, that don't feel invited, that have been brought in culturally as well as uh, uh, in terms of uh, function and transportation. These created the four uh, uh, components of our plan, identity, adapting ground, mobility, and, and expanding the constituency. And in the end, we end up at a whole, a holistic project that's really uh, uh, underpinned by the, by the resigned, uh, designed by resilience uh, mission, which is to take on a bigger, more multidimensional, holistic problem, get all the uh, more siloed agendas together, and come up with something bigger, something that isn't just about patching coastal uh, flooding, but it's about leveraging the, that work to create something that will be a major regional identity at the scale of Point Reyes or Mount Tam or Elkhorn Slough. These are places that are in everybody's mental map, and we need to work to, to get it there. So what, you know, what do you call this place? Um, and, and how does it work? What, what is it? What, you know, generically, what is it? We would say that it's an ecological central park um, for everybody. And if Olmsted was doing this in 1852, he might have drawn that, but he wasn't here, and I don't know if they would have gone for it. But now we have land that is that is uh, had a lot of things done. There have been salt ponds and farming. Different things have, have settled at different rates. There's a lot of uh, triage and, and first aid first, and then a lot of development of, of the ecology going forward. But can we mark this out as a place to persist forever as a 21st century park, a 21st century central park, and have access all the way around, bring, invite everybody in, and get them into the center in ways that are sensitive and productive. These are all the uh, stakeholders that we work with, and some of them are landowners, people involved in conservation, uh, community access, and transportation groups. And everybody's got a, got a different take on it. But we've met with all these people, and this is kind of, this is the sort of the quantitative uh, documentation of everything. We all have, you know, charts like this. But what comes out of it, you know, after that much work and discussion, is uh, the key deliverable, the qualitative deliverable is uh, trust, gaining people's trust and goodwill and ability to join an effort going forward uh, where we can call on them because we're, we're not going to be able to resolve this, you know, uh, today. We're starting something that's going to go on for, for two years into a very specific type of effort that will be needed. Um, and we'll need to find governance precedents that will work. Uh, things that have, been, have come up so far are the idea of a wetland mitigation bank for things like SFO uh, development, uh, funding uh, conservation by leveraging water bonds, uh, cross-county uh, governance structures. We're going to need that. We've got four counties involved here. And a jurisdictional partnership that bit depends on regional identity and something that could work almost along the lines of a joint power authority at some point. So what we've done already, and we're talking about implementation now, but this is, it comes out of what we just looked at. Um, identify local champions, we've done that. They don't all be identified yet yeah, uh, to you, but uh, we are gonna work with them to convene a regional Blue Ribbon Commission that'll work for the next year to engage with MTC's evaluation of alternatives on the highway, but expand the discussion into something much larger and more holistic and see if we can begin to uh, influence the agenda by, by the end of the year. And then after that, we'll have a new governor and we need to really bring forward uh, 
a, a roadmap for a joint powers authority and to be endowed in working, working with the state uh, endorsement, hopefully, of the governor himself. This is very ambitious, but it's got to be. And so we're, we're, not, we're really just beginning this process, uh, but in a, in a productive way. Um, so the road, what about the road? Where does it go? There's about 20 alternatives been looked at here, or six. Some of them, they range from you know, raising the berm where it is, uh, the highway's on, to building a tunnel across the bay, or pushing way, way north, or putting a causeway in the current uh, right of way. We've been looking at two of them for a very specific reason. We're looking at the idea of a causeway, both a northern route that skirts along some of the uh, uh, more solid land and some bridges, uh, uses Highway 20. This is not getting everybody where they want to go fast enough, probably, in Solano County, but it creates a great situation for, for the ecology. The other one is to create a scenic southern loop that, through design, creates uh, open door, a kind of front window, a great bring exposure and new uh, visibility to this ecological central park. The northern route is co-located with rail. It has that advantage. And the southern route creates a loop around the entire uh, zone. But it ought to follow these principles. It ought to be elevated in a, in a causeway almost as much as possible. It ought to allow uh, habitat and hydrologic connectivity. It should respond to the intrinsic qualities of the landscape. It shouldn't just be a, a, a piece of engineering. It should be a beautiful piece of engineering that responds to topography and space. And it should be an iconic front door that build, it leverages the money we're going to spend on this to uh, bring uh, new visibility and, and uh, beauty to the, to the system of uh, crossings and infrastructure uh, that ought not to be you know, dumbed down, but it ought to be raised way up. Actually, the uh, US Fish and Wildlife, they have principles for road, uh, road construction that we're following right here. It has to do with connectivity, uh, renewing degraded landscapes, creating iconic front doors. And in Norway, Chesapeake Bay, different places around the world, people invest in bridges. People invest in causeways because they, they, bring, they try to bring people there. They bring, attract tourism. They create I iconic uh, recognition to, the, to their region. And they generate money because people come and they want to check it out. They just want to be on the thing. Can we make a bridge that people would want to be on? Working with Michael Malson, we put together, a, we had a sketch that he drew the where if you think about the bridge, uh, uh, the causeway as, as a cable with strands, can we start to unravel these things and begin to attach them to the landscape, o point things to different directions? Can we divide the lanes and the, and, the, and the bay trail? Begin to unspool this cable, orienting to mountains and local topography. So this is one rendition of, an, of, of a highway that would run more in the current location, but it's quite different. But what it tries to do is, is, number one, to be beautiful and to be light and to be delicate and to engage with the geometry of the sloughs and uh, create an experience where people can use this as a recreational access point. So this is a Grand Bayway. And it's, it's working with the, uh, with the alignment along the shore. And we call it Grand because it needs to have high ambition. And we call it Bayway because it's about movement of both people and of water. Those two things need to work. Uh, uh, be coordinated, and they need to work independently as well. This is also an, another route that we, we really should be considering as well. And this, and this works for, for uh, much holistically, I suppose, for uh, the ecological preservation and the development of the marsh berm. But we would be, we think either one of those could deliver what's needed to get to something bigger, which is, which is an ecological central park. I think people in Solano County wouldn't be totally happy with this. And uh, People, uh, people that are the ecologists wouldn't be happy with the southern route. But here's the deal. We have to find a way in the next year to get these people to the, to the table together. There have to be trade-offs. You have to be able to say, all right, I can accept your 20-foot high causeway if you'll let, you know, open it up wider for the water to flow through here. Get this kind of exchange happening. And if we don't, uh, most likely nothing will happen or maybe we'll have 20 years of litigation and then it will be, uh, nothing will happen for the community. Um, and one of the advantages of this elevated highway is it allows you to look over uh, all of the nature, all the regeneration work that's going to take place. And Eric's going to tell us about that. Okay, hi. Can you hear me? Yep. All right, so now let's talk more about wetlands. Um, I love wetlands. I'm kind of passionate about it. But we really feel that infrastructure can actually improve environmental conditions, that it can instigate change for the better, much in the same way that Blue Ridge Parkway actually restored a mountainside. You never know that now, but actually the parkway, the road, improved the environmental conditions along that. 
So we think here along the, uh, this is a historic look at the, the marshlands that existed as far as the eye can see. At the edge of the bay of San Pablo, wave-driven sediment from the extensive mudflats pushed up to create a natural high point here. And it is there that 37 was constructed in 1928 using dredge fill from Barrow Ditch alongside the road. And by this time, lo they lost all the marshes, all these marshes the size of San Francisco. Decades later, the sediment actually pushed up against that road, creating a vast strip marsh in a very short time, actually, that stretched out so far that drainage is actually now an issue, deteriorating the marsh and critical habitat for endangered species. The, 37 le the Highway 37 levee is actually impeding tidal flow, limiting sediment and marsh migration to the north. Elevating the highway and removing the levee achieves unpeded tidal and hydrologic connectivity, allowing the strip marsh to retreat and migrate freely with sea level rise. So very important. Uh, to the north along the smart owned uh, rail line, here's the northern limit to six foot of sea level rise and the southern limit to the Carneros wine region. Uh, 10 foot box culverts in the area that drain numerous ephemeral streams and creeks have been known to disappear within 10 years trapped by sediment. So there's a lot of sediment actually around here. Um, here we think we can activate the rail line and actually is important to that improve the corridor by elevating wide causeways at these hydrologic crossings and this can provide paths for sediment, habitat and floodwaters. As sea levels rise, these corridor improvements help establish marsh buffers with fresh sediment, paths for migrating marshes, and with the likely retreat of vineyards faced by increased water salinity, actually provide an opportunity to restore coastal terrace prairies and oak transitions. This also could be the northern option for um, 37. Stable ground conditions certainly benefit cost, but we still need to elevate causeways to double these corridors that can support the highway and support movement and migration of ecologies. Um, so there's likely not enough sediment in the whole entire bay to restore the marshes to the former glory. But we do have four principles of which we think we can adapt these lands. The first one, to adapt the uh, edges of the sloughs where sediment and key habitat exist, work with smaller restoration projects that add up to a larger connected network, and work with the limited sediment supplies that can harvest these sediment pulses through big flood events. That a lot of this happens, you know, in infrequent, instantaneous flood events. And all of that develops a heterogeneous strategy which adapts to dynamics over time while maintaining biodiversity. And here's how these principles actually translate to an adapting spatial framework. All to grow key quarters of patches and quarters to maintain a resilient marsh necklace framework connecting the bay to the upland and linking species migration, storing floodwaters or capturing sediments. We have three fundamental strategies, hyperaccretion gardens, a sediment train, and a benthic lab, all with small air experimental and innovative prototypes calibrated to various conditions across the baylands. The benthic lab here works with an understanding that we need to live with water with limited sediment resources, except some of the unknown, unpredictable, that benthic ecologies can really benefit heterogeneous baylands. We've worked with Richard Hindle from UC Berkeley on numerous prototypes that can help provide expanded unique habitat in the Bay Area. To the north, in the transition zone, on areas along Highway 12 and Sonoma Creek, these are areas of imminent flood concern. This was not a major rain event that causes flooding uh, this year. They are uh, sustained by private levees with marginal land values. Alluvial conditions here um, release a lot of sediment and water debris sources, but that there's limited capacity within these creeks for flooding. Um, and it also happens to be served by the smart rail line. So we think that rail corridor can actually help transport excess sediment and debris from flood events from Petaluma to Napa and enforce the rail corridor with an ecotone levy. That this, where this corridor is enforced, we can actually work to provide increased room for the river strategies, benefiting major flooding that occurs along Sonoma Creek and Highway 12. And over time, the low-lying subsided lands can actually receive flood water, laid in, uh, eager to release the sediment and debris. And now the vital rail corridor is protected while it's helping establish and accumulate marshes at its base. Hyperaccretion garden is another room for the river strategy, actually a room for the sluice strategy, intended to stage marsh expansion into heavily subsided lands at the edges, often seven to eight feet lower than the sluice. It involves creating a, what we call a chamfer levee, the shortest distance between uh, bends in the slough, establishing vegetation to help enforce uh, erosion and trap sediment. And then we can manage a few levee breaches, flooding the subsided lands, but not in areas that are too vast. Over time, these areas and reservoirs Provide are the reservoirs for major flood events, receive sediment and debris over the years, providing critical habitat for endangered species, and gaining ground in the face of sea level rise. This is how it looks up close, what this area looks like today. It's extreme in size. It has an inverse relationship to natural hydraulic flow. It's completely backwards. We should start now by working with programs like STRAW, engaging in regional schools to establish innovative prototypes. 
and that when breached, flooding can actually be monitored to understand what is most successful and where is the most successful. With continued access to these lands, importantly, the community can actually see the results of their efforts, see sediment, accrete it, habitat expand it, and immediate access tools for engagement on what's actually happening. Our team has tested these strategies with various schools in the area. They get the basic principles of the hyperaccretion garden. They're engaging, they're fun, and they generate numerous strategies, like those of the Marshmans by uh, restoration experts, have actually relevancy and merit. The same way that community engagement um, with youth makes better parks, we know that. Expanding the constituency for marsh restoration to a broad area should benefit the many. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're going to get people here. Um, a marsh is a mysterious place. Uh, most people don't think of preserving them for a park or anything, but they, we know that they're ecologically rich, and we know that we need to. Um, it, it is This area is used for something. Even though many people don't know what to do there, there are people that do. Uh, there are hunters, there are fishermen, there's the raceway there, which is quite popular, and of course we all go there for wine. and in past years uh, to take in the waters in Calistoga and other places. But we want to change that. At the Exploratorium, we've developed a number of different ways to engage people in their environments. We call it place-based learning. And sometimes we use the term instrumenting the landscape. And what this means is we put instruments there, but they are also often exhibits. So we could, we could measure the tides. We could talk about what's happening with the groundwater, the wind patterns. In other words, to get people there to get engaged with these environments so that they feel like they understand them, what's going on here. They become part of the stewards or perhaps people that are um, restoring these landscapes. Uh, they become better observers and they spend time on the trails. The Bay Trail has hundreds of miles and more of them are happening here and they're great opportunities for educating people. We also need to get this rail line working again. It could be a commuter train. Right now it's just used for freight occasionally. The tracks were laid in the late 19th century. They need to be revitalized. So here's our site. The red lines are the trains, uh, the white are the highways. Uh, if we make this an ecological front park, um, I'm going to try to tell you some of the things that we could do if we travel around the bay land. So I'm going to take you on a little journey here. And our first stop is Cullinan Fishing Camp. Um, and you get off the highway here, and you're able to uh, go down an old existing levee. And when you're there, uh, you know, you can be up on this walkway and see this land. Uh, one thing that's hard about marshes, and unless you're up high, you really can't see what they are. So it's really important we think of elevated places for people to get a vantage point. So the, the idea here is it's a pontoon fishing camp. This will be where there's a lot of waters coming in. So we could create a campground that's floating. People would get a sense and feel of the environment when they're there. They can camp, they can perhaps hunt, they can use kayaks. It's a little quirky as a place maybe, but I think it would be an interesting place to visit. Um, our next stop is Tolly Creek Walk, and this is right near the uh, Sears uh, Gateway and also the uh, racetrack. And on the Tolly Creek Walk, you could go up to the highlands or down to the bay, and in the highlands we learned um, there's a former lake bed uh, called Tolly Lake. It's now Tolly Lake Regional Park. And when the 19th century settlers drained this pond, they found uh, like hundreds and hundreds of charm stones and Native American uh, objects. They learned that it was a ritual healing site. Uh, they sort of forgot about that, but right now it's being restored. There's a Miwok group that's helping to bring the story back to this. This could be a narrative trail that comes down to the stopping point. You get out of your car here. There could be some kind of cultural field station that orients you. You could go to the racetrack, you could go to the bay, you could go to the uplands, and here you're at a crossroads. Uh, you're able to learn about ecology, about history, about cultural uh, values. Our next stop is Wingo. This is a little bit uh, deeper in the, uh, in the marsh. Um, it was a former landing site, so uh, you know uh, ships would come in and with freight. Uh, and people, they'd get off here, they'd get on a train, they'd go up to Sonoma or Napa or wherever they were going. And this guy, Louis Semino, uh, was the gatekeeper. Uh, he gives us a lot of cues about how people lived back then on boardwalks and riding bikes. And, and this ghost town still exists. Wingo is still there. No one lives there. The bridge is there. So we could reactivate it. 
It could have a, another classroom, outdoor classroom. It's in the marsh so people can really begin to understand what's going on there. Kayaks could come, it could be a saloon, it could have a youth hostel. It's also right next to one of the accretion gardens. So people will have a first-hand view of how this land transforms over time. It's also on the Bay Trail, so those who just like to walk and run and recreate can do what they do. It could be a campground. But the most important thing is that psych uh, environmental psychology tells us that when people understand places, they feel connected, they have a sense of stewardship, they feel like they have agency, like they have a voice in what can happen to these landscapes. And I think that's what we're trying to do here, get people there so they can understand that. Our last stop is Bookley. So Bookley is right on the edge of the marsh. Uh, these lovely uh, drawings from the, 18th, uh, from the 19th century is from an atlas in Sonoma. So there were a lot of little uh, you know, uh, farms like this. They all existed, they were real. As a matter of fact, the family there lived in one of them. And I happened to know this person who, uh, oddly enough, sent this picture to me and we realized that the Cooper who, uh, uh, family lived there and she's actively doing the research. So there are stories of these ranchers and what they did. Um, so Bookley, again, it's out in the marsh. People could get on the trains. They could come here. They could bike. And uh, it's, uh, it's this confluence that we're really working towards. But more importantly, I think people connect to place. And we learned that people want to come here. And the things they want to know is, uh, when are the tides coming in? Uh, what birds are there? What season should I go? What should I wear? What can my kids wear? What, how do we make sure that we enjoy ourselves? And we're thinking that resilience is not just about engineering and good ecology and good governments. It's also about people connecting to these places. So we have created our first um, tool for, uh, for people. And it's a map that uh, takes you on the tour that I just took you on. Uh, you get to see all these places and the future of what might happen there. And also uh, an ecological map to understand what's going on. So, uh, so already, you can start enjoying these places. And hopefully, this will get people there uh, engaged in the future. So we're out of time. Yeah. Ask us, ask us, ask us in the Q&A about our urban gateways. <laughs> Sorry, when I was up there, I couldn't see that. Thanks very much. Do you want to yeah, uh, invite your team to uh, come team. on up for the jury? Yeah, I can ask you about that. I was wondering where the development comes. You know, so the urban gateways must be in, in the next layer of what's going to happen here. You know, where's the damn gas station or the charging station? Yeah, or yeah, yeah. How do, I, can, how do, I can describe. So what? if you would like to do that, okay. you can continue. Yeah. Um, two key places that you, uh, do you enter, really. Uh, one from the south at the tip of Mare Island. The other one at Napa Junction, right in the middle of American Canyon. So these are both places where those communities uh, can arrive, and they can, uh, they can uh, the Mare Island Gateway is an intermodal hub. We're using an existing rail bridge together with ferry access, uh, parking for cars, when you get launched onto uh, the whole system on bike, uh, uh, running, or walking, or uh, kayak. And uh, this has been pulled back really from the northern tip to a place where we can really keep an a, a intermodal hub and a, and a little... Uh, uh, face for the whole project, the museum and so forth there, uh, and uh, be on terra firma for the next 50, 50 years, very important. And in Napa Junction, uh, there is a fantastic whole series of open spaces that move from Napa River. There's a landfill park, there's an existing wetland, there's a, a planned park, there's a whole series of existing conventional open space projects that are either there or happening, and they go all the way to the town center. So in that case, we're proposing a major a new hydrologic connection, string these projects together, connect by water uh, and, and through a riparian system all the way up to the town center that's currently being constructed on Highway 29. Just follow Thanks. with that, letting you complete. But uh, so it's an ambitious project and beautifully drawn. So thank you for having a big idea. Um, but you say things like, you know, the, the private levies and the low land values and all those kinds of things. What obstacles 
are there? I mean, if, if this is a good thing to create in terms of a transportation system, an ecological system, and so forth, but then you have land ownership in these places. What's your approach to that? To, uh, to, land, to private land ownership and to the obstacles to doing smart things. Yeah. You know, the fundamental problem we face. Well, a lot of the pr private landowners that exist, particularly along Sonoma Creek, are uh, pretty challenged right now by flooding. And they're looking for an answer. Uh, they have their private levies, and there's nobody stepping forward to fix them. Uh, Sonoma Land Trust right now is looking for a project, uh, a, a more of a room for the river south of Shellville Bridge, uh, to demonstrate what could be done and to uh, build levies for them that will be durable, uh, and they can maintain a little less of their property, but something that's stable uh, and workable. Anyway, I'll stop, but uh, that, I think that is the next thing because, you know, we know smart things to do. This is a smart thing to do. Uh, my friend here, the Dutch room for the river, the room for the slough, but we can't cooperate long enough to do anything, right? So the, the mechanism to influence people to use this together, uh, participate together, and compensate fairly, you know, I, I would uh, wonder how much you thought about that. You don't have to necessarily answer, but that becomes the bete noir, right? That becomes the obstacle to doing a good thing. Yeah. You want to go? Well, and I, I think we're, you know, looking at this as a regional Bay Area project, and this area has unparalleled opportunities to actually connect significant restoration efforts together. So the San Francisco airport needs to mitigate. Um, could we provide a mitigation bank, a regional mitigation bank, so that the permitting is expedited of which to put funds toward areas along Sonoma Creek so that we develop not just, you know, these, this is vast areas. We're not talking thousands of acres. It, we really just need to start with small par portions of that along the edges. And I think we can start to do that with the mitigation that needs to be done all around the Bay Area. And this will really aggregate to make significant investments in really critical habitat that this area has unparalleled connections to. Uh, this is a very big structural proposal, and uh, I understood when you were when you are talking about people, you are mainly talking about the users of this big park and the infrastructure. Uh, I, I would like to know more about your work with a specific uh, group of the community. Do it again. The questions are related to work around specific communities. I mean, I think we've really centered a lot of our work around the agencies that have agency in this land. Um, there's not a lot of community that have agency here, and that's, that's the issue. We've gone out to communities around, that surround this area, to where they exist now, and a lot of them aren't aware of that. What is an opportunity? It looks like it's e ecologically important, but we don't know we can go to that. So they don't have agency in here, and we're trying to bring that, and that first step is increased awareness. And so these maps seem like it's a you know, they don't know that this is this could be their lands, and uh, it is public land. It should be, um, and there's some important things to consider because of the the uh, the habitat that's critical for endangered species. That kind of, to a sense, you know, really abuts some of these agendas. But the U.S. Fish and Wildlife are into this as an urban refuge. They are looking at this as an urban refuge. So it. It's a part of that, and we just need to bring the community to the table. And and we've started to do that. We've just initiated it. Also, we just need to uh, work through the planning effort uh, to create a sense of public ownership. That there's somebody, there's a, you know, if there's a JPA or something else that has established a mission that is common to many different jurisdictions and agencies, and they've all agreed on this together. And so this, this will help generate visibility in itself. And that the idea that the uh, transportation bonds coming up could provide, you know, 200, 300,000, and it's got to, something's got to happen with that money for the highway. So there's an urgency about that. And so we need to leverage all the things that are all happening already related to transportation, but use it in a way that the, uh, the discussion uh, will create a bigger uh, frame of reference, a, a bigger means of establishing criteria. And so a big part of that has is, is got to be people learning that, th wow, I'm, I'm going to have this, and I didn't even know it was there. So it's, it's, a lot of it is, uh, again, more outreach. Thanks so much for your presentation. And what a huge group of people behind it here. It's so nice you could all be here. Um, I applaud, I guess, the planning in of this two-year uh, program of potentially leading to towards the Joint Powers Authority or the like. Um, thinking optimistically, if you do get everyone, everyone that you've mapped out aligned, can you rehearse for us again 
what your suggested sequencing would be of bringing things forward, um, maybe in advance and leading up to the implementation yeah. of the Bayway. Right, right. So first of all, we can't wait two years to know something's happening. So there need to be projects. I mean, this is one project right here we already finished. But there need to be uh, near-term things people can see on the ground, uh, both to do with bring, getting the community out there through, through Exploratorium, one of their specialties, but also improving the, the environment for regard to flooding, uh, working with uh, Sonoma Land Trust in particular right now. There's things we can, we'll be able to do, we expect, with them in the near-term future. But then at the same time, that this is happening. It's kind of like uh, workshopping within the landscape. At the other side, there needs to be a more of a top-down pl planning process but there also have to be the establishment of near-term projects, and I think the two urban gateways are absolutely key, because this, is, this will be the place where if we can uh, assemble enough uh, resources around a more ambitious project, to, to, uh, both transportation and economic uh, environmental solutions knitted together, that we can establish a credential for the mission, because the mission is huge. And if we can't demonstrate within you know, five years or, or seven years that we can do this, we can build this thing, and we can build a a nicer uh, piece, of, piece of the causeway, together with all of the uh, intermodal connections and, and a space for people to get them launched, that will get people believing. And then that will attract much more resources than things that are only scattered. And that could be in Naba Junction and hopefully also in, uh, in uh, uh, Mare, Tip of Mare Island as well. Those are, that's the places where the community needs to come and feel they, I already starting to own this. I, I get it. I think I'll, I'll build off of Sarah's question. It's I appreciate the ambition of this this project, and actually the the framing of the ecological central park I think is new since the last time I saw you guys present, and I think it was actually really helpful for picturing what you guys were trying to do. But I think for me, especially given that there is no immediate constituency, and yet in your presentation you kind of identified um, that two thirds of all all of the folks who are passing through here are either at or below the median income if the urban gateway establishing that is kind of the first near-term project, that still feels huge. And so I'm just wondering if you could break it down even more as to what are the pieces that then build up to that, that you start to get people operating as champions across the stakeholder spectrum. Kushal, you look at So Resilience by Design gave us like about 96 days to do all this. <laughs> And we couldn't even present it completely to you in 25 minutes. But we want to thank them that at least they gave us this time because it's true that we don't have names identified or in written who's the project champion is gonna take it forward because when we go to talk to them in individual rooms, they all agree with it, they say it's a great idea. When you bring them to a common room, it's either silence or mostly disagreement. But, but when you go and talk to the individual rooms and present this idea to bring an identity, just come together and form, avoid litigations, don't give money to the lawyers anymore. Avoid litigations, form an identity. Everyone is on board with the ideas. There are just like restrictions in terms of policies and that's why I think the first and most immediate near-term project is to make something like Boston Island Harbor Compact make something like the KT Prairie Conservancy, the conservation models that we have started. And even the community groups, when we go and talk to them in American Canyon and Vallejo, they all agree with it. The site is size of twice as San Francisco. You will never get enough money or enough sediment to do it if you just do it in your own rooms. So I think the idea was to just make this one identity, combine your efforts, combine your fundings. And then they ask us, do you have funding? I said, no. And I tell them, you have funding. $100 million is coming. $100 million. $100 million is coming in the regional three measure if it gets passed, fingers crossed, 5th June. Vote for it, whoever can, I cannot. <laughs> uh, but you have the money and the ideas are there. This took 96 days and you have more time at, in, in, with this money that you can invest and pr create this platform to implement the ideas. I think that's the first near-term project. The gateways, it's secondary. <clears throat> It will happen, it will happen, but first you need to do that platform to get everyone together. But say you only had $100,000, can, can we do something right now? It's kind of your question too. Uh, we need to make trails, we need to make access. The number one thing we heard from people is, we don't feel invited, there's not really equal access you know, for people. Certain people can go there, they got kayaks or they have permission to go, and what about me? So 
if all we do in the beginning is to establish a network of connected trails, to get an interim bay trail established, the minute the public begins to see things for themselves, this, you know, it's true in real estate and it's true in open space projects as well. Attention comes, people are taking pictures, there's, there's visibility for stuff, and immediately there's more pressure to do more and more interest in, in generating money. If we had $100,000, we would make a system of, of uh, even if they're interim trails that connect, be able to move all the way across, and we can do that for a modest amount of money like that. And we should, and we should phase it out more like you're suggesting. This is one of the few places around the bay where saltwater wetlands have the space to migrate landward in a rising sea and there's some sediment. And so I think it's a compelling case just based on the, the habitat. But the case would be even more compelling if you linked what you're, do, you're proposing to the resilience of the cities around the, the landward margin. Have you done that? The, uh, Eric has. <laughs> I'm glad you asked. How we integrated the cities into this effort. That's transportation. Right. Um, fundamentally, they need better transportation. This is a decentralized community across the North Bay, and they don't have, the roads aren't increasing in width. They don't want the roads to increase in width, but they actually need them to. And so they also need public transportation. I think that's what we're really trying the to. Community, communities themselves, so. The what? I'm sorry? The communities, the cities themselves. The cities them, along the edge. Yeah, I think there's real uh, projects in Vallejo, um, along the Gateway, Riverfront Parks, um, uh, visitor centers along Mare Island that need to activate along Mare Island. Um, in American Canyon, there are park projects on the table that have community support that could overlap with exactly what we're talking about that is not funded, uh, that has these critical linkages that they, they want to implement, they have the plans. So it's, it's, we're, we're trying, trying to find ways that this all these efforts can plug into what the city needs. They have what they need right now. They just need the funding. And they, they, they know what they need. And a lot of times it's really in, in, in keeping with the, the principles that we're talking about. And it's, and it's, you know, they know it's environmentally sensitive, but they, they do want trails. They do want access. They do want this. Yeah. And there's a thank you so much for your presentation and the great work. Um, think in the book, but not so much now, the economics of it is addressed. Because there's like a prevented loss added value, very easy business case. I mean, infrastructure is most easy for uh, the economists. So tell, yeah, uh, tell us a little bit about that, because it, it's so helpful in driving the investments you need forward. So yes, it's culture, it's access, it's small projects, and so forth and so forth. At the same time, in the context of the region, uh, from an equity as well as from an economic point of view, the business case is perhaps the most simple part. So mm -hmm. give us a little ammunition for yeah. that. Well, I think the, the big fish here is the transportation money and the need to do something about this highway. And uh, Caltrans needs to uh, get people on board with what they're doing. And they're having difficulty right now. And they embrace the idea of what we're talking about, expanding discussion, expanding the frame of reference. Um, because it, one of the things, the practical side of it, they might be able to get to do something sooner, and they might not have to, to fight, uh, do have court fights and things like that. So there's, there's a you know, sizable chunk of money of, I don't know, 100 million or two million, coming out of the, the bond that we're voting on next week. And then there's a series of smaller pockets that we tap into, uh, the wetland mitigation strategy, uh, water bond that's coming, and the, uh, I'm, not, I'm not answering yeah, your question. Yeah, no. so that, that's interesting where the money comes from, but that, it's actually, wherever the money comes from, and that's a, like very problematic here in this region, uh, uh, is the economics of what you propose. Uh, you have a clear, let, in, you talk to an economist, you have a clear prevented loss, and then you have a clear set of added values from social point of view uh, uh, to environmental point of view, cultural and economic. Mm -hmm. This is like, I'm not saying the most easiest part, because it's a big project, very complex and regional. But at the same time, it's also not so hard for an e economist to build this business to case. And I think, yeah. you know, strengthening, I, I like the fact and all the questions are, where's the community now to relate and the culture and so forth. It's me, yeah, I like that. But here, I'm, you know, I'm not an economist, so, yeah. but I, I do know if you bring in that part, 
uh, the case becomes, from a political point of view, even more compelling. Because if the road fails and the mobility fails and the equity part, knowing that two thirds fails, you know, you're, you know, you're going downhill, but you're, you know, you're in the, you're in the gutter. Uh, so from a, this financial economic point of view, you can really make this business case. And I think next to the compelling narratives and the connection with the people and nature and the bay and the sedimentation, and blah, 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 you know, it's uh, big, 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 amazing. But the, the, the part that is missing is actually you know, to get it done, you know, present us with the business case. Yeah. More quantification, yeah. what is the value that's generated and what's it yeah. worth? Yeah. That's your point, yeah. No, no, you, you asked a very good question, and I'm a total <laughs> believer of that, because uh, in Norway today, 4% of their GDP comes because of scenic highways. And I see this as an opportunity to do that for the Bay Area, to do that for Vallejo, American Canyon, and the North Bay itself. One in every 15 person there, 15th people there is employed in the tourism sector today. And this has just happened in the last five years. So it's a, it's a very good question. And we should definitely put those numbers and possibilities forward to improve the economy and opportunities for people living around this new scenic causeway. Right, and then you should anticipate that it's going to grow in value and how you're going to include the people who, still, who live there now in the next place they live, right? Because you're going to create more wealth. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to not displace the people who live there right now? Because your base case is that there's a low income component to, this, to these places. Well, how do you anticipate that this is going to grow in value and build that in from now? Which goes back to the community and say, what do you want your place to be? Well, that's a great, that's a great moment to leave it on. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>